All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think uh, based on the President's comments at the Pentagon, he essentially has taken care of uh, any opening remarks I might have. So we can uh, just dive right into your questions. Kathleen, do you want to start? Okay. Um, actually, first I wanted to ask if you could uh, confirm that some relig religious leaders are coming to the White House today and mm -hmm. describe to us exactly what the purpose of the meeting is. Right. Well, uh, let me start by noting, uh, Kathleen, that the White House uh, is routinely engaged uh, in an active dialogue with faith leaders across the country. And uh, there are a number of engagements today, and I'm happy to do my best to explain to, to you. Let me start by saying that the, the President does not plan to participate in any of the meetings that are planned. These are, these are meetings that are slated to take place at the staff level. Um, the first is a conference call uh, arranged with a broad array of faith-based organizations across the country. Uh, this is a call that will be led by uh, Valerie Jarrett, and the Executive Director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, Melissa Rogers. Uh, and this will be a conversation uh, to discuss efforts to combat discrimination and highlight the need for welcoming uh, all faiths and beliefs. Um, certainly seems a timely topic for a conversation like that. Uh, the second is there will be an in-person uh, meeting here at the White House today convened with a, um, a smaller group of Muslim American uh, leaders. Um, these are uh, individuals who will meet with Valerie Jarrett, uh, Cecilia Munoz, who is uh, the director of the Domestic Policy Council here at the White House, uh, and with Deputy National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes. Uh, the third meeting uh, is a meeting that Cecilia Munoz uh, will lead with representatives of the American uh, Sikh community uh, to discuss uh, how the administration is supporting that community and to discuss ways to work together to address uh, concerns and challenges. Um, and then there are some uh, uh, additional meetings over the course of the week, uh, including uh, one here at the White House on Thursday. Uh, again, these are all slated to be staff level meetings, but yet uh, are um, representative of the kind of ongoing dialogue that the White House maintains with religious leaders of all faiths all across the country. Is there a reason that the White House is concerned about backlash uh, against Muslims in the current climate, that the President in his um, Oval Office remarks didn't raise that issue, but instead sort of came down on Muslim leadership for not pushing back against extremism and, and sort of took a harder line, but didn't specifically reference um, more recent concerns. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd encourage you to go, to go take a look at the President's remarks. He does talk about how uh, important uh, the Muslim community uh, in America is to our broader national community. And um, so I, I'd encourage you to go back and, and check the President's remarks on that. And he's not going to participate, though, in any of the events you talked about today. Uh, the, the current plan is for him to not, uh, for these to be uh, meetings that are led at the staff level. Okay. okay. And then I just wanted to rewind a little to the to climate change, um, you know, if, I, if I could, um, over the weekend. Uh, it seems like sort of the next step now, well, I mean, the, the big concern for you all looking ahead is whether or not the President's successor will actually stick to the terms of this deal, mm -hmm. and as you know, most Republicans are ignoring it or talking about tearing it up. So I'm wondering what's your strategy for trying to make sure that this thing actually holds beyond the next you know, year or so? Does the President plan to specifically try to convince Republicans that this is a good deal? Well, uh, Kathleen, I, th I think what you'll see from the administration is a uh, commitment from day one, starting today, to uh, moving forward with implementing this important agreement. and. You know, frankly, many of the commitments that the United States uh, had made in the context of the Paris Agreement uh, are commitments that we made some time ago uh, and began implementing some time ago. So uh, this is a, uh, um, a, an ongoing effort. One of the keys to us reaching this agreement was a commitment on the part of all the countries who are participating to subject themselves to a periodic review of the commitments that they've made. Uh, the idea, as the President described, is, is, is essentially that uh, as uh, our economies begin to orient toward a low carbon future that will start to see important investments in things like energy efficiency uh, and renewable energy. Uh, and that means that there will be an, a much more powerful economic incentive uh, behind investments in those kinds of, of new technologies. And that's the significance of this commitment. It's not just a recognition on the part uh, of governments uh, about the need to reorient our economy. Uh, this also represents um, an acknowledgement that there's an opportunity for significant investment uh, in this field. Uh, let me give you, uh, there are a couple of examples here that I can give you. 
And the President has long recognized that reaching an agreement like this ultimately can be a very powerful benefit for the U.S. economy. Uh, ultimately, you have companies here in the United States that have made important investments and important gains in renewable energy. And now they have customers all around the world, because now we've got company, or countries all around the world who are seeking to uh, invest in those technologies that will allow them to meet the goals that they have laid out. Let me just give you uh, two examples that I think are useful. Uh, and the first one is one that I cited before, Westinghouse Electric, a good American company. Uh, in light of the significant commitment that the Chinese have made to essentially cap uh, their emissions uh, in the years ahead, uh, it means that they are going to have to significantly scale up uh, alternative sources of energy. Uh, and it means they are going to have to consider something other than just building coal-fired power plants, for example. One of the areas, one of the technologies that they hope to tap into uh, are nuclear power plants. And so China has actually already uh, signed a contract with an American company, Westinghouse Electric, to build four nuclear power plants uh, in China to help them meet their goals. So that's sort of one example of how an American company uh, is going to benefit from the commitment that the Chinese are making. Let me give you one other example. There's a company called First Solar. Uh, this is an American company that is developing, constructing, and operating solar projects uh, around the world, uh, many of them the largest or among the largest in their regions, including uh, Latin America, the Middle East, Australia, and India. As we see additional comp companies or countries deciding how precisely they're going to meet uh, these commitments, they're going to have to turn to uh, investments in solar energy. And that's going to create enormous opportunities uh, for uh, American companies that are already leading the way uh, in these kinds of innovations. So, uh, I, so let me come back to your direct question, which is that we will see in the years ahead that there is a powerful economic incentive in the United States for us to follow through on our commitments and to make sure that other countries are doing the same, because that will create a tremendous opportunity uh, for American businesses. Okay. Jeff. Hey Josh, um, following up on the climate uh, issue, does the White House see any irony in the fact that the President has just gotten what is a major legacy achievement and yet will be presented in the next day or two, hopefully, uh, with a spending bill from Congress that will approve lifting U.S. oil exports? Well, uh, Jeff, at this point I don't want to speculate about what will be included uh, in the in the, in the final budget agreement. It looks pretty likely uh, that that's going to be I know that's the, the subject of extensive discussion. And, uh, you know, obviously I've uh, described to you uh, uh, on a couple of occasions why that is a policy that we don't support. Um, but, uh, you know, once we have a, uh, an, an omnibus bipartisan compromise budget agreement to consider, uh, you know, we'll have an opportunity to uh, sort of weigh the puts and takes. Uh, again, without sort of weighing in on any specific proposal, I would anticipate that there will be some elements of the budget bill that uh, are not consistent with the kinds of policies that we have long supported here. Uh, but that's the essence of, of compromise. And uh, the President is only going to support the budget agreement if he does believe that is clearly in the best interests of the country and our economy. Uh, but again, once there is a budget agreement that's been put forward, we'll have an opportunity to uh, consider the merits of it. I would press you on that, but I suspect you're not going to say more. Uh, do you <laughs> that's true, I, and primarily just because this is something they're still actively negotiating. So, but we will have, uh, assuming that Congress does uh, meet the deadline that they have set for themselves for producing this agreement, uh, that should give us ample time uh, over the course of this week to discuss it. And uh, so I'll make sure that we have an opportunity to do that. Based on what you've heard from the weekend, are you optimistic that that deadline will be met this week? Well, I, I continue to be optimistic about the uh, about the fact that there appears to be some uh, bipartisan recognition in Congress uh, that this, um, that a deal needs to be reached, that it must be a compromise, and that it far outweighs, um, uh, or, or is a far better alternative than shutting down the government. By Wednesday? Um, well, again, we'll have to see uh, exactly what timeline they're operating on. Um, uh, you know, I, I do continue to believe, and this is based on uh, my limited knowledge of the ongoing negotiations. Uh, that uh, completion of the agreement would be hastened uh, if we got uh, Republicans to uh, relinquish their um, insistence about the inclusion of ideological writers in the budget agreement. And um, you know, I, I think we've made some progress on that front, but uh, we're not quite done yet. And on a final topic, 
Uh, a planned summit between the presidents of Russia and Turkey has apparently been canceled, mm -hmm. according to the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. uh, is the White House concerned about the de-escalation effort which the president has called for, uh, that that is actually not occurring? Well, uh, the president, since the first day that the, uh, the news broke about the uh, Turks shooting down a, uh, a Russian military aircraft, uh, has urged the leaders of both countries to de-escalate their rhetoric and to take actions that would de-escalate the tension between the two countries. Uh, I think it's fair to say that there's more work that both sides probably need to do uh, in that regard. Uh, but um, I think it's notable that in the, you know, in the weeks since that occurred, you know, we haven't seen any tangible escalation uh, at this point. So uh, that's uh, you know, a glimmer of optimism uh, in that situation. Uh, I'm confident this will be something that Secretary Kerry will discuss with, uh, with President Putin when he's in Moscow tomorrow. Uh, again, the continuing need for the Russians to de-escalate uh, their tensions with the Turks. Uh, and one good way they could do that uh, is actually to integrate uh, their, the Russian efforts uh, against ISIL uh, into the broad coalition uh, that the United States has already formed and is leading. That, of course, would require uh, the Russians to actually invest heavily in those counter-ISIL efforts. Uh, and uh, uh, that's not something we've seen them do uh, yet to our satisfaction. Okay. Chris. Uh, Josh, last time the, the Pentagon, uh, last time the President went to the Pentagon to meet with national security advisors over the summer, uh, Secretary Carter announced a week later the Pentagon would start a review to lift the military's ban on transgender service. Did the President seek an update of that review at the Pentagon? Chris, I don't believe, uh, I did not attend the meeting at the Pentagon today. I don't believe that that uh, item was on the agenda. Um, I think this was a meeting that was focused on our uh, counter ISIL efforts. Uh, the President does uh, have an opportunity to meet with Secretary Carter on a weekly basis when Secretary Carter uh, is in town. Um, I don't believe that meeting will occur this week because I believe Secretary Carter is headed to the Middle East uh, later today uh, to, again, continue conversations with our partners and allies uh, about our counter ISIL campaign. Uh, but I know this is something that the Pentagon continues to work on, and I know this is something that uh, Secretary Carter continues to be um, paying close attention to. Is reportedly planning to formally lift the transgender ban on May 27th. Is there any reason to think that won't happen then? Uh, you should check with them on their time frame. Okay. Margaret. Josh, um, to clarify something the President said, uh, he said today in his speech at Pentagon, the special forces I've ordered to Syria have begun supporting local forces as they push south, cut off supply lines, and tighten the squeeze on the top. Was he acknowledging that special forces are now on the ground <coughs> inside of Syria? Uh, Margaret, what the President was acknowledging is that the work that the President has given to our special forces uh, in Syria has begun. Uh, I don't have any updates in terms of, you know, when that occurred or where that occurred or um, uh, any additional operational details, uh, but uh, the President did confirm in his remarks that that work has begun. So, it, it, not to put too fine a point on it, but this would be different than just advising from afar that this would seem to be um, a decision or a movement forward to be acknowledging today that the operators are in place. Uh, this is an acknowledgment that the uh, intensification of our uh, efforts uh, inside of Syria by more closely linking special operators with American special operators with local forces on the ground uh, has begun. Uh, there were a number of weeks where um, you know, there was some question about that, and um, I can tell you that that work has commenced. Um, can I ask you as well, um, in talking about this review of visas and visa screening processes for foreign applicants to come to the U.S., particularly with the K-1, mm -hmm. does the White House have a view on whether social media posting should be part of that process? Well, the, this process is under uh, careful review by both the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department. And they will have to consider a range of things, including uh, the, the amount of resources that are allocated to screening individuals who do apply for visas. So uh, the President has asked the two agencies that are responsible for implementing this um, program to review it and come back to him with a set of recommendations about uh, how the screening requirements uh, can or should be tightened, uh, and the President will consider uh, their recommendations carefully. Uh, so at this point, I'm not going to weigh in on what they should do. Uh, they're already tasked with look, taking a close look at the program and coming back to the President with what they believe uh, should be done, and the President will take a close look at that. When you 
say resources. Is it a question of that? Because some would raise the issue of freedom of speech and other questions about whether someone expressing opinions online should be used in a judgment for or against them as perhaps a threat to the United States. And it would impact the decision of whether to clear them through a background screening. Uh, I wouldn't leave you with the impression that uh, resources are the only consideration. Uh, but they certainly are an important one when you are considering uh, implementing a program. Uh, you know, the process has, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people into the United States each year. But broadly speaking, I mean, the President being a constitutional lawyer and, and having obviously uh, spent time thinking about what constitutes free speech or not, does that question weigh into this decision? Or is it purely, you know, in a different category because of foreign nationals? Well, I, I think the President's top priority here is the national security and safety of the American people. Uh, and that will continue to be the case with m ensuring uh, that this K-1 visa program is, effect is effectively implemented uh, consistent with the law uh, and consistent with the values that we hold dear in this country. Uh, right now, this is a program that is under review by both DHS and the State Department. And you know, we'll take a look at their uh, recommendations that they bring forward. Any timeline on that? Uh, I don't have a sense of what that timeline is. Uh, obviously, the uh, uh, the president is feeling a, a sense of urgency about this, and I think that was clear in his comments last week, where he announced this review was ongoing. Uh, and um, uh, I'm confident that the officials at the agencies that are responsible for carrying out this review share that sense of urgency. Uh, but I don't have a specific timeline to share with you. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Without leaning too forward on what Margaret was just asking you, it would seem to make sense if you're an employer, right? You would check the social media footprint of people that might or might not be coming in. Can you at least acknowledge that it would seem to be a decent idea to consider that, not just for the visa program, but any other entry program? Well, Kevin, this is something that the, that, that the State Department and DHS are taking a look at. And uh, I guess, um, so uh, because they're responsible for implementing the program, I want to defer to uh, their expertise in terms of how the program works uh, to render a judgment about what's the most effective way for them to efficiently process and uh, to efficiently process the applications that they receive, while also making sure that um, we fulfill the President's top priority, which is protecting the safety and security of the American people. I'll try to circle back in just a second, but I want okay. to ask you about uh, energy policy for just a second. Yeah. Uh, aside from just letting uh, the free market sort of work its will, are U.S. policymakers, in your opinion, doing anything to take advantage of the historic plunge in oil prices um, to sort of exacerbate the problem for, say, petro states like Russia, for example? Is that happening from a U.S. policy perspective? Well, uh, I guess you'd have to check with the Department of Energy about this. I'm not aware of any specific policies uh, that are geared uh, in that direction, but uh, maybe they have some ideas that uh, uh, could better answer your question. Nothing that you've heard of, nothing, no nothing. idea that, hey, listen, if we can drive down oil, we can really squeeze Russia or other rogue states, anything like that? Well, no, because I, I think, Kevin, we've, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the briefing setting when I've been asked questions about the uh, inordinately high price of oil uh, and the high price of gas, uh, I've been quite forthcoming in acknowledging that the, uh, that the U.S. government uh, had very little impact on our ability to set the global price of oil. Uh, that, that was true and uh, was a common refrain in my answers when the price of uh, oil was uh, at or near all-time highs. Uh, and it happens to be true uh, even when the price of oil is at or near all-time lows. Let me ask you also um, about an update on what's happening both in Afghanistan and are you aware of the uh, Iranian testing ballistic missiles? Um, what's the administration's uh, viewpoint of that? I know that previously you sort of tried to separate that from, you know, the, the conversation that we've had with the Iranians and sort of the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give me an update on that and how the White House views those ballistic missile tests? Yeah. Well, uh, Kevin, there have been a couple of reports, a couple of different reports uh, about uh, Iran testing ballistic missiles. Uh, there was a report uh, earlier this summer uh, where uh, Iran basically came forward uh, and was, went public with their ballistic missile tests. Uh, and the United States uh, went to the United Nations Security Council and raised uh, concerns there uh, and initiated a, a process uh, at the United Nations uh, against Iran for those actions. Uh, many of the individuals who are implicated in that test are already subject to significant financial sanctions that were put in place by the United States. And 
The President engaged in conversations with our GCC partners at Camp David earlier this summer. And many of those discussions focused on how the United States could work jointly with our partners in the region about countering Iran's uh, ballistic missile program and mitigating the risk that it poses uh, to the United States, our interests, and our allies and partners in the region. Uh, so this is something that uh, uh, has been on the President's radar screen for uh, quite some time. Now, uh, in addition to all of that, there are more recent reports uh, about a potential Iran ballistic missile test. Uh, this is not something that Iran has announced publicly, uh, and I don't believe that it's something uh, that we have confirmed at this point. Uh, rather, we have um, said that we were um, aware of those reports uh, and taken a look at the veracity of those reports. Okay. The Senators uh, Kirk and Ayat wrote a letter last week to the President asking how the administration plans to respond uh, to those tests. Are you aware of that letter? Has the President uh, received that letter? Uh, I'm not aware of that letter. I wouldn't be surprised if it has been received here at the White House. Uh, and if, if they're referring to the more recently uh, reported uh, ballistic missile tests, uh, I can I tell them what I would tell you, which is uh, we're aware of those reports and looking into uh, the veracity of those reports. Okay. And lastly, um, and this is sort of a little, a little out there, I just want to try to tighten this up a little bit. Um, the Department of Homeland Security had that secret policy, if you'll allow me, um, to not uh, allow immigration agents to review a visa applicant's social media uh, profile. Does the White House support something like that? Well, uh, Kevin, I, I think that the Department of Homeland Security has pushed back uh, against those reports. Uh, so uh, for uh, true fidelity to what exactly the policies were, I'd refer you to the Department of Homeland Security to check that out. But what I can tell you is that uh, what the President has asked for is a review of the program to determine what uh, measures are in place to allow the program to operate so that we can allow individuals uh, seeking a, a K-1 visa to enter the country, right. but to do so uh, based on uh, the need to protect the American people. Uh, and so for the best way of doing that, uh, that's exactly what the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security are taking a look at. They're going to back, they're gonna come back to the President with a set of recommendations about how uh, this program can be effectively implemented to, uh, to achieve our goals. But that wasn't something that the White House said, you guys should maybe not do this. There wasn't sort of a lean on from uh, here. Uh, no, I can confirm that that is not the case. Uh, but for what policy was actually in place uh, at the Department of Homeland Security, I'd encourage you to check with them. Okay. Richard. Thank you, Josh. Um, I just want to go back first to the uh, speech of the President Josie um, mm -hmm. He talked about um, uh, going to the Middle East and, and trying to uh, get a greater involvement of allies in the region. Would you say that the campaign against ISIL at the moment, with the 9,000 um, strikes, um, mm -hmm. Is, is, uh, the President is, is overall, I'm not sure happy is the right word, but satisfied with it. And the next step definitely implies a, this greater involvement from Middle East allies on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, Richard, let me just start by saying definitively that the President's not going to be satisfied until ISIL has been degraded and ultimately destroyed. Uh, that's our goal, and the President's not going to be satisfied until that's been achieved. Uh, so there clearly is important work that needs to be done, uh, and the President assembled his national security team at the Pentagon to determine uh, uh, from them about what we're going to do to build on the momentum that we have built up uh, in some instances. The President talked through uh, a few of those examples. Uh, and it may create some additional opportunities for the United States and our coalition partners to further intensify uh, our efforts against ISIL's leadership. Um, you know, the President made note, one of, I think, probably the most interesting data point that the President cited uh, was a reference to the fact that the counter-ISIL coalition that we have assembled took more strikes in the month of November uh, than any previous month of our efforts. Uh, that is a reflection of a couple of things. One is it's a reflection of some of the ramped up commitments that we've seen from our European counterparts, which we certainly appreciate. Uh, however, it is also um, an indication of the increasing flow of intelligence that our coalition is benefiting from. Uh, we've got greater fidelity uh, and intelligence around the location of some of their oil infrastructure, for example, and whether that is uh, stationary objects like refineries and uh, wellheads uh, or tanker trucks that move around a lot. Uh, and obviously being able to destroy that infrastructure is an important part of our efforts to shut off ISIL's financing. We know that engaging in the illicit trade uh, or illicit sale of oil uh, is one way that ISIL finan finances their reign of terror. 
Uh, and so we want to continue to be vigilant about uh, taking those strikes. The President also ran through a pretty compelling list of senior ISIL leaders that have been taken off the battlefield in recent months. Uh, that is also a testament to the increased flow of intelligence that our uh, military operations are benefiting from. Thanks to whom? Well, I think a variety of things. One is we've seen some greater commitments from our partners to things like uh, ISR. This is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, uh, essentially from drones uh, that can monitor movements uh, on the battlefield. Uh, there have also been operations that have been undertaken by the United States and in some cases our coalition partners uh, or, or, or by local fighters on the ground who have been able to obtain uh, significant troves of intelligence uh, based on raids of individual facilities. So let me give you one example. This is an older example but still a relevant one. When the United States special operators carried out the raid in Syria against Abu Sayyaf. This was one of the uh, masterminds of the uh, uh, ISIL financing effort. Uh, that th not only was that individual killed in the operation, but there was significant um, uh, intelligence material uh, uh, obtained. Uh, laptops, um, you know, file folders, thumb drives, other pieces of, of um, uh, of hardware that uh, our intelligence analysts can take a close look at uh, and obtain material that can be relevant both to uh, taking strikes against ISIL leaders uh, but also taking strikes against ISIL infrastructure. The more information that we have and the more knowledge that we have about the way that ISIL conducts business on a day-to-day -day basis, the more effective we can be in disrupting that business. Uh, that obviously is a, uh, is a priority. Uh, and so. Margaret asked about the, um, about the special operators that are uh, assisting uh, local forces inside of Syria. The President also has recently announced the standing up of these expeditionary task forces. They'll be based in Iraq, but these are also special operators that will be uh, essentially at the ready uh, to carry out raids when it's determined uh, that those raids can be effective. And the goal of those raids will not just be to uh, either detain or kill uh, ISIL leaders, but also to capitalize on opportunities to exploit significant troves of intelligence. Uh, and uh, so that continues to be a priority. Thank you. Uh, just, just to, to center again on my first question, okay. question uh, Josh, I just want to see if I understand that the coalition has been doing well, but uh, or mm -hmm. could do even be better, but that, that there's a, an, another level or a, a, a different kind of step that the Middle East uh, allies can could take. Mm -hmm. Well, there are there are certainly some things that we would like to, to see, and you know you, you touched on one example. Uh, there is uh, some indication that we've discussed publicly before that some of our GCC partners uh, appear to be somewhat distracted by the sectarian conflict in Yemen, uh, in a way that's div diverted resources from our ongoing efforts against ISIL. Uh, that's something that we've discussed publicly before. Uh, I can assure you that that's something that's been raised in private on a number of occasions uh, quite directly by a range of senior administration officials. And I'm confident that this will be the subject of some discussion when Secretary Carter is traveling in the Middle East uh, later this week. Uh, but there are other things that we would like to see uh, done. Uh, there is more that we could do when it comes to uh, ramping up our uh, counter-messaging campaign against ISIL. Uh, we've talked about that. In, in some ways, that is probably the most challenging part of this effort, uh, but it's critical to our success. And there's an important role for our Gulf Coast partners, our GCC partners, to play uh, in that effort. But, you know, look, there's some things we need Congress to do as well. Uh, for example, Congress could confirm uh, Adam Zubin. He's the financial expert at the Treasury Department who's responsible for leading our counterfinance efforts. Uh, he's somebody who served in both Democratic and Republican administrations. The President noted today in his comments at the Pentagon that shutting down ISIL's financing is a core component of our efforts. Uh, and right now, we've had an individual nominated to serve in, uh, in a leadership role uh, for that aspect of our strategy for more than a year. And Congress has inexplicably, and let me be more precise, Republicans have inexplicably uh, refused to confirm him. So uh, w in terms of talking about things that uh, can be done that would uh, bolster our efforts against ISIL, uh, Congress is far from blameless. Okay, Jim. So, so is the message this week, the theme this week, we got this? Is that, is that the message you're trying to convey to the American people? 
Uh, I, I think the message that we're trying to convey to the American people is that the President and his team uh, are quite hard at work uh, on a strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. And when it comes to the military components of our strategy that the President discussed with his national security team at the Pentagon today, uh, we've made a lot of important progress. Forty percent of the previously populated territory that was controlled by ISIL inside of Iraq uh, is no longer in their control. There are important communities like uh, Beji and Tikrit where uh, Iraqi forces with the assistance of uh, our coalition partners has driven ISIL from those uh, populated areas uh, and retaken uh, those towns. Um, there's a strategic highway uh, between Raqqa and Mosul that's been severed uh, and that's because Iraqi forces were able to retake the town of Sinjar. Again, they did that backed by coalition military airstrikes and that uh, allowed them to drive ISIL out of that area and uh, more effectively isolate uh, Mosul. Uh, so there's important progress that uh, has been made. Uh, but we need to do more to shut down their financing. We need to do more to counter their uh, uh, messaging online. And there's more that we can do to try to advance the diplomatic process uh, that will uh, try to bring an end to the political chaos, at least, uh, inside of Syria. And Secretary Kerry will be uh, leading a meeting in New York uh, later this week uh, in pursuit of that effort. And uh, I noticed that the President said uh, in those comments at the Pentagon to ISIL leaders, you are next. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it seems as though, and, and I'm just curious if you could take us uh, perhaps a little bit into the internal deliberations that go on here at the White House. Do, do you have a sense that perhaps the, the President, that, that you have needed to ramp up your rhetoric a little bit uh, to display a little bit more urgency uh, when it comes to this counter ISIL campaign because of the level of anxiety that is obvious uh, within the American people right now? Well, Jim, I think the American people got a sense of that urgency when the President of the United States spoke directly to them on live national television during prime time from the Oval Office eight days ago. Uh, so I think people are keenly aware of the sense of urgency that the President feels about this. Uh, but yes, it's also important that people understand the uh, progress that's been made uh, thus far. And you feel like this message is not getting out. Well, I think, I, think the I think the success that we've had in taking some ISIL leaders off the battlefield is one. Uh, important way to measure our progress. It's certainly not the only way. Uh, and uh, I think the, the President's uh, words today uh, are not necessarily new. Uh, you know, I, I, just off the top of my head as the President was speaking today, uh, I recalled the comments that the President used, I believe it was at the VFW convention earlier this year, where he talked about how, uh, as Commander-in-Chief, uh, he was proud uh, of the efforts that our men and women in uniform had carried out at, on his orders uh, to take uh, extremists and terrorists off the battlefield. Uh, these are terrorists uh, affiliated with a variety of uh, terrorist organizations, not just ISIL, uh, Osama bin Laden being the most famous of them. Uh, but I think this is uh, the President walked through that today because it is part of uh, our strategy to um, uh, apply significant pressure to ISIL's leadership and make it more difficult uh, not just to uh, capitalize on the safe haven that they have uh, inside of Syria to plot and carry out attacks around the world, but also uh, more difficult to engage in the online messaging campaign that they're currently pursuing to try to radicalize others around them. I guess I'm just curious, as, as political animals who, who crunch numbers and love metadata and, and all that sort of thing, you can, have you been able to decipher what is going on with these poll numbers that show 60 percent of the American people don't believe the President has an effective strategy for dealing with ISIS? Is that, did you, did you look at that data and decide we need to do toughen our talk uh, when it comes to ISIS, and that's why he, he said things like, You're, you are next, and, uh, and, and some of the comments that he made today are... Well, Jim, I, uh, the, the President, when he goes to meet with his national security team at the Pentagon, uh, is not looking at public opinion polls. Uh, the President feels a responsibility, uh, as the Commander-in-Chief, to make sure that he has communicated clearly to his team that he is interested in any and all ideas they have for intensifying our campaign against ISIL. And we've talked about that's essentially been the President's approach to this, which is that we have put in place a military strategy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. There are some aspects of that strategy that haven't panned out as well as we would have liked. Many of our Republican colleagues in particular were suggesting that we should be devoting many more resources to try to training and equipping uh, Syrian rebels. Uh, that effort didn't really work out very well. Uh, but what we have been doing and what has shown some fruit uh, is to equip some moderate opposition fighters inside of Syria that are already having some success in pushing back uh, against ISIL. So we've intensified our efforts to supply greater assistance and equipment 
uh, to those forces that are fighting on the ground. The special operations raids are another example of this. So there are a couple of raids that have been carried out by U.S. forces that have succeeded in taking ISIL fighters off the battlefield and exploiting significant troves of intelligence. So the President has put additional resources behind those efforts that are led by our special operators. Uh, that's the essence of our strategy, and that was the discussion uh, at the Pentagon again today, was to look at our strategy, to consider those elements that are showing the most promise uh, and the most progress, uh, and to discuss ways to intensify and put more resources behind those efforts uh, that are yielding some progress. And uh, the, their closing arguments in, the, uh, in those trials in Baltimore uh, surrounding the death of Freddie Gray, is there a message from the White House to people in Baltimore this week as, that, as, as those decisions may be coming down soon? Well, uh, not a new one. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, obviously there is a, uh, um, a judicial process that's uh, underway, and I want to be careful of uh, not saying anything that uh, could interfere with uh, that ongoing process or, or those uh, deliberations when they uh, occur. Um, you know, Jim, I think the most relevant thing I can cite to you is the, the President's comments after the, the video of the police shooting in Chicago was released a few weeks ago. Uh, the President noted in his uh, comments on Facebook that he was proud of the way that the community had responded, that that video prompted significant concern, uh, I think for rather obvious reasons, uh, and there had been a forceful but peaceful uh, uh, display of concern by the community in Chicago. And the President uh, described how he was proud of his community for the way that they responded, uh, and um, you know, we're certainly hopeful that uh, as activists and individuals and in other communities have similar concerns to express, uh, that they do so peacefully. And uh, has a decision been made on whether the President will go to uh, San Bernardino, uh, perhaps on his way to Hawaii? Uh, I don't have an update for you on the President's itinerary at this point, but we'll keep you posted. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Abel. Um, on that question, on that line of questioning, no matter the city or what have you, it seems to be a ripple effect when we hear these verdicts come out. Um, Baltimore was just up the road. The president did not go. People were hoping that he would go. But does the president need to come out with and, and, and stand in these areas that are poverty stricken and, and have seen this, I guess, increased or visible uh, issue with police, this tension with police in the black community? Does the president at some point need to stand somewhere? And what do you say to the potentials of a ripple effect? which could happen with Baltimore sometime this year. Well, April, I think the, the first thing that I would observe is uh, something that I'm, I'm sure that you recall. is about uh, six or eight months before the, uh, this tragic death occurred in Baltimore, the President actually did travel to Baltimore, uh, and he did spend some time in the community uh, talking to people in the community about the kinds of investments in the economy there uh, that could be made, uh, about the impact of the Affordable Care Act uh, and other job training programs that have been advanced by the administration, what impact that has had. Uh, on the community. Uh, so the President has had the occasion to travel to, um, uh, to communities to talk about the variety of challenges that they're facing, uh, including in Baltimore. Uh, and those were important, uh, important visits. So, but the ripple effect, uh, you know, Baltimore is Baltimore's New York, Baltimore's Ferguson, Baltimore's Sanford. I mean, there's a ripple effect with all of this. What do you say to the nation as the nation is waiting about this? Well, again, I, I think the President's response has also been characterized by the uh, formation of this task force on 21st century policing uh, to um, surface best practices that are being implemented by law enforcement agencies across the country. That will have the effect of uh, building trust between local law enforcement and the communities they're sworn to serve and protect. Um, and you know, this is an issue that uh, the President has also spoken about quite powerfully uh, in a variety of settings. Uh, and. This, I'm confident this is something that over the course of the next year or so will continue to be um, uh, on the President's radar. And this is the third anniversary of Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook shooting, and there seems to be a, a large number of people protesting at the NRA headquarters in Virginia. Um, I know this White House was hopeful for groundswell from the American public when it comes to issues of gun violence. Is this protest on this anniversary enough to change the conscience? Uh, I don't think one protest is going to be enough, uh, but I, uh, you know, the President continues to um, uh, encourage the American people to make their voices heard uh, on these issues, and you know, he continues to believe that the only way we're going to see the kind of change um, 
in Congress that we need to see in order to get some of these common sense uh, bills passed uh, is for those who are in favor of more gun safety, uh, speaking up and speaking out and making clear to their elected representatives that this is a priority. Uh, and, you know, I cited at the beginning of the briefing on Friday, uh, April, this poll uh, of New Hampshire uh, Republicans. Uh, this was a poll that was just conducted at the end of last week. Uh, I guess it was at the beginning of last week. It came out at the end of last week. Uh, but it noted that 75 percent of the um, uh, likely uh, participants, likely voters in the Republican primary in New Hampshire uh, support a federal law requiring universal background checks for anyone seeking to purchase a gun. Uh, that's an indication, I think, that there is some uh, building momentum uh, behind common sense gun laws. Uh, but uh, one protest is not going to make a difference. Uh, but certainly more people speaking out, like those who are protesting today, uh, is going to be what's necessary uh, for us to see the kind of legislation that's so strongly supported by uh, Americans, uh, the Democrats, Republicans, gun owners, and non-gun owners all across the country. Lastly, understanding the dynamics of this battle on gun control and understanding the time that's left in this administration will over here, is it realistic to say that with this protest and others, if there were a ground swell, that even with any push that it just made because of the, the back and forth and the fierceness and, and the, the money and the, the strength of the NRA, is there a possibility or is there no possibility that anything could happen before the end of this president's term? I'll tell you this, the president's not giving up. Gardner. Can you talk a little bit about the faith-based meetings that you're having today? Is this, are the, were these recently scheduled or are they a result of the campaign rhetoric that's been going on in the Republican primary? And how, can you discuss how hurtful that rhetoric has been to U.S. interests and image abroad? Uh, Gardner, we're gonna, uh, let me follow up with you on the scheduling of these meetings. It's my understanding that at least one of these was previously scheduled. Okay. Uh, but, you know, we can get back to you on the details. Uh, you know, as it relates to the uh, U.S. image uh, around the world. You know, I think people in other countries look to the United States as a nation that is built upon the values of tolerance and acceptance and freedom. And that is a reputation that we wear with pride. And the President has talked in the past in uh, different contexts about how our commitment to those values actually advances our national security interests around the globe. Uh, and, you know, from Secretary Kerry to Secretary Johnson uh, and others, uh, including national security experts who served in the previous administration, have observed that the kind of offensive, hateful, divisive rhetoric that we've seen from a handful of Republican candidates for president is damaging and dangerous. And um, what I would anticipate will be the subject of some discussion uh, in the meetings that you asked about it will be the commitment of this administration uh, to standing up and continuing to speak out in support of the values uh, that are central to the founding of our country, but also critical in terms of advancing our national security interests. In, in the campaign in Syria and in Iraq, there's always been this tension between uh, achieving military objectives and protecting the civilian population. As the military campaign ramps up, you seem to be getting closer to uh, potentially uh, killing civilians. You're now going after the oil infrastructure. You're going after trucks. A lot of these, of course, are driven by civilians and others. There are other targets. Um, talk to, of course, on the Republican side, you hear people talking about carpet bombing in the area, about making the sand glow. Yeah. Um, those obviously would mean serious civilian casualties. Talk about this administration's <coughs> view of uh, your objectives militarily while also protecting civilians? Are you gradually moving toward greater, riskier operations from a civilian standpoint, or are you, have you kept your criteria in terms of judging the risk of this the same throughout? Uh, 
Gardner, I think for a precise answer to your question, uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. Uh, essentially, that's an operational uh, question that you're asking about uh, how they factor in uh, the risk of civilian casualties. I can tell you that they're operating under guidance from the Commander in Chief to do as much as they can to avoid those civilian casualties. Uh, our cause is not advanced by killing innocent civilians who in Iraq and in Syria, who in many cases are themselves victims of ISIL. I, as the President noted in his comments, the ISIL leaders are using innocent civilians as human shields. Uh, that's obviously not a behavior that we condone. Uh, and the values that are on display as we conduct this campaign uh, are one of many ways to highlight the difference between the values that ISIL is trying to impose on innocent people and the values that the United States and our coalition partners are going to great lengths to defend. One more. You answered the question on whether the President will visit San Bernardino. He's visited nearly all of the sites of recent mass shootings. If he's not going to go to San Bernardino, why? What, what would be different about this? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want to prejudge the outcome of our scheduling decisions at this point, so um, uh, stand by for that. Okay. Chris. Thanks. The President Long has counseled patients that this could be a long fight against terrorism and against ISIS, but today he said very specifically we recognize that progress needs to keep coming faster. And is that a change in tone, or is it in fact, is it a recognition that in the light, in light of what happened in Paris and in San Bernardino, that a stronger push is needed? I think it is a recognition of the President's conclusion that he's not going to be satisfied until ISIL is degraded and destroyed. But he said and specifically uh, has to come faster, something that seems <coughs> different than what he has been saying, which is to counsel patients. This is going to be a years-long fight. Yeah. Uh, again, I, the President would still counsel patients, uh, but what he wants to do is to build on the momentum that we're already seeing inside of Iraq and in Syria. Uh, and there's a long way to go, uh, but if we want to capitalize on the momentum that has been built up, then we need to quickly reinforce and reintensify uh, our efforts behind those aspects of the strategy that uh, are working. And that means the United States uh, taking a look at our strategy to, to determine what aspects of our strategy can we uh, intensify. It also means we need our coalition partners to ramp up their assistance. And we've seen good news from uh, in the form of additional commitments from our allies in uh, the UK and France and Germany. Uh, but we also need to see a greater and more sustained commitment from uh, our partners in the region as well. Uh, we also need to see uh, improved performance from uh, Iraqi forces. Uh, there have been some important gains that they have made. The President noted that they were uh, making some progress uh, around Ramadi. Uh, but uh, there is more that we believe that can be done there to uh, ensure that Iraqi forces are building the capacity that they have to provide for the security situation in their own country. You mentioned earlier the ramping up of uh, you know, counter messaging, but specifically, what's sort of on the wish list, wish list that Ash Carter is taking with him? What's he very tangibly looking for, hoping for, in terms of those kinds of commitments? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in terms of the, the meetings that he is going to have this week, we'll, have, uh, we'll be in a position to talk about them a little bit more specifically as the week goes on um, and as more details about the uh, Secretary's travel uh, are announced. Uh, but the President, but, but the Secretary will be meeting with the leaders of other countries uh, who have made important commitments to this campaign. Uh, and he has uh, uh, in mind some additional steps that we believe uh, they can and should take uh, to support our efforts. Uh, and we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll be able to talk about this a little bit more later this week. So give us a sense inside that room of, of sort of how things work. Was it more of informational, here's where we are, Mr. President. Uh, what, because the last time in July when he was at the Pentagon, uh, eventually some very tangible things seemed to come out of that, including the decision to send in special ops uh, forces. So it, was it a series of recommendations? Can you give us a sense in that room of sort of what the tick-tock was of that meeting? Uh, primarily the meeting was an opportunity for the President to be briefed directly in person by uh, the by our nation's military leaders uh, about the strategy that they're carrying out against ISIL. Now, he also got updates on other elements of our strategy, too, 
Uh, but uh, the reason that the meeting was at the Pentagon, and you had General Austin, who is the commander of Central Command, uh, give the president, as he noted, a, a detailed briefing of the, uh, of the operations that are uh, underway and have been for some time now. Uh, so it was an opportunity for the president to get a detailed uh, update uh, from his team. Uh, and you know, the, the president has been interested in getting these detailed updates because he wants to try to hone in on those elements of our strategy that are showing some progress so that we can intensify our support for those elements of the strategy. That if we, that in some cases it may be by providing additional resources to those elements, we can actually see additional progress. Uh, but in each case, that's the kind of uh, order that the president has given to his team. Uh, let's take a close look at our strategy. Let's give, offer up a cold-eyed assessment about what's working and what's not. And let's be creative about figuring out how we can capitalize on the opportunities that have been created by those elements of our strategy that are showing important progress. Okay. Andrew. Um, both you and the President have alluded to this idea that the Iraqis moving on Ramadi need more support or could benefit from more support. Um, has he approved um, Know, close air support or any specific measures? What, what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, uh, the I have no new announcements in, uh, in terms of uh, new approvals that the President has given uh, in that regard. Uh, part of what well, – let me take one step back, Andrew, and just say that so much of the progress that we've been able to cite about the advances that Iraqi security forces have made on the ground has been because we've seen uh, Iraqi forces um, unified uh, and acting under the command and control of the Iraqi central government. They're benefiting from training that's provided by not just the United States, but by our coalition, um, members of our coalition. Uh, there are a number of countries like Australia and Italy that have uh, important resources to devote to those training efforts. And what we believe is necessary is to see further intensification on the part of Iraqi forces uh, as they build up their capacity, as they build their numbers. Uh, and, you know, I'm confident that this will be uh, uh, something that will be discussed over the course of Secretary Carter's trip to the Middle East. Okay. Just on another issue that was raised in the, in the address, um, there's a specific fo focus on killing leaders of the Islamic State group. Um, is there a renewed focus on going after Baghdadi? Is there a specific team tasked with killing him? Mm -hmm. uh, for the resources that are devoted to, to that uh, aspect of our strategy, uh, Andrew, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. Uh, obviously, our uh, interest is in applying significant pressure uh, to everyone in ISIL that's in a leadership role. Uh, and, uh, you know, this does have the effect of uh, disrupting ISIL's operations in two ways. The first is, you know, obviously if you're taking those leaders um, off the battlefield, uh, uh, it means that ISIL needs to go through the effort of replacing them and having somebody else uh, fulfill that responsibility. Uh, but the second thing uh, is that we're applying enormous pressure to ISIL's leaders. And so even those who are still living, uh, they're having to go to great lengths to protect themselves and to provide for their own security and make sure that they are uh, careful about their travels and careful about their communications. And that makes it harder for them to plot uh, and plan uh, and carry out uh, acts of violence. It also makes it harder for them to engage in the other day-to-day uh, -day operations uh, of running their organization. Uh, and so we're going to make sure that that pressure uh, continues to remain in place. Uh, and it's also why the exploitation of this intelligence information is so critically important, uh, that there could be information uh, in, uh, that is obtained that could give us a better sense uh, of how these ISIL leaders move around the country. Uh, they could give us a better sense of, um, uh, of, who they, of, of with whom they associate. Uh, and you know, that's why this, uh, the collection of this intelligence uh, is, a, uh, is an important priority. And it's, it gives you the other reason it's a good uh, example is it gives you a good sense of how uh, integrated the strategy is, that you don't just have a bunch of people, intelligence, you know, working over on, you know, this in, in this office and then, you know, the, the folks who are in charge of the military strategy somewhere else, uh, that, that our campaign benefits from the careful integration of all these different elements. Uh, that's true of our counterfinancing counter efforts uh, and um, uh, 
Uh, and it certainly is an important part of the, the strategy that the President's team's implementing. Okay. Alex. Hey, thanks. Um, let me go back to the, uh, the ban on uh, oil exports. Mm -hmm. uh, we just ran out a story uh, reporting that House Democrats are, are engaging on this issue. There's been other reports to that effect. Um, they're apparently talking about concessions such as uh, uh, additional for federal assistance for renewable energy or, or even some sort of assistance for refiners. Is the White House comfortable with this kind of forced trading? Do you think that could yield uh, a policy that the President could support? Well, Alex, at this point, I'm going to uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the uh, ongoing conversations, uh, even on a hypothetical basis. But uh, let me say a couple of things. You know, our opposition to lifting the uh, ban on the exporting of uh, U.S. Uh, crude oil uh, is something that we continue to oppose, primarily because we believe that that legislation is unnecessary. Uh, however, uh, we do, of course, uh, believe that there is more that Congress can and should do to increase investments in renewable energy. Uh, and I described earlier how uh, those uh, early investments uh, have been critical not just to our current uh, economic strength, uh, but also because of the um, tremendous opportunity uh, that appears to be in place down the line for American companies that are at the forefront of this kind of uh, innovation. That there is now a global market for solar energy, for example, as countries around the world consider how they're going to meet the commitments that they've made uh, in Paris, they're going to have to consider uh, this kind of, of new technology. And the more success that American businesses have, the more likely they are to win that business. Uh, and that's going to be good for our economy back here at home. It's going to be good for American workers. Uh, and uh, it's one of the reasons that we continue to be optimistic uh, that the climate agreement that was reached in historic fashion in Paris over the weekend uh, isn't just uh, an important step in saving the planet. Uh, it actually creates some important economic opportunity for the United States and American workers back here at home. Concessions uh, lifting the ban would not necessarily be a deal breaker for the White House. The well, White Alex, this falls in the category of those kinds of things that if we're just you and me trying to work it out and trying to figure out what's fair and what we'd be willing to w willing to trade, that um, you and I could probably reach a, a, a pretty good budget agreement uh, in the next couple of hours. Uh, unfortunately, there are a, a, a whole lot of other people that feel like they should have a say on that. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're still working through all of the puts and takes here. and. Uh, you know, I've declined to sort of weigh in on one side or the other in terms of drawing uh, uh, clear connections to the kinds of things that we would veto. Uh, but I have been tried, I have tried to be quite candid about our position on these range of things. And, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, primarily for um, uh, administrative or procedural reasons, um, you know, we uh, oppose lifting legislation that would lift the uh, ban on the exporting of uh, American crude oil. Uh, but we certainly do want to see Congress, and hopefully they will in the context of this budget agreement, uh, make the kinds of investments in renewable and clean energy that uh, are good for our economy and have the potential to create good uh, American middle class jobs down the line. I don't mean to harp on this, but by, by explicitly linking these two issues, it, it sounds like you're comfortable with them being related. Uh, I'm only mentioning these two issues in the same breath because you did. Uh, so uh, I don't mean to. <laughs> Uh, leave you or, or anyone else with the impression that, uh, uh, that, uh, that I'm condoning or opposing uh, any sort of uh, potential trade here. I'm just trying to be as explicit as I can about our position on these issues. But ultimately, it'll be a responsibility of Congress to figure it out. So, John. Well, Bergdahl, uh, his lawyer just announced that uh, his case has been referred to a general court martial. I wanted to get your just general reaction to that first, if you got any. Yeah. Uh, John, unfortunately, in this instance, I'm very, very limited in what I can say about this ongoing matter. Uh, the, this is uh, a case that is currently working its way through the military uh, justice process. Uh, and as uh, the spokesperson for the commander in chief, uh, there's a lot of sensitivity about the potential for um, influencing the outcome of that military justice proceeding. So, um, I'm really not able to react even in the most general terms to the latest twists and turns in the case. There's an established process uh, whereby uh, the military will um, both conduct this investigation and consider uh, the results of it. And I don't want to say anything that could be perceived as influencing uh, that process in any way. Without commenting directly on the case, then, can you say, given all the time that's passed since the trade happened, 
whether U.S. Uh, security, national security interests have been impacted either way, whether it's made the country safer doing this trade by getting five less people at Guantanamo, or whether it's made our uh, interests, uh, you know, more in danger given five people that are out there now threatening us. Well, uh, those individuals uh, that uh, were uh, transferred from Guantanamo uh, were uh, our individuals who are still, uh, still in Qatar, uh, and they are uh, there under a whole series of safeguards uh, that uh, limits their ability significantly uh, to cause any harm to the United States uh, or our interests. Uh, but the bottom line for this matter uh, is that uh, Sergeant Bergdahl uh, was an American citizen who put on the uniform of the United States military, uh, and he was uh, rescued uh, by uh, the United States military. And uh, the Commander in Chief feels a responsibility to everyone who puts on the uniform that we're not going to leave them behind. Uh, and the way that this, um, the way that Sergeant Bergdahl was rescued, I think, is a testament to the President's commitment uh, to uh, that principle. And then I just wanted to follow up quickly on uh, Kevin and Margaret's questions about uh, the visa um, issue that uh, ABC reported out today. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I understand correctly that the White House did not pressure the Department of Homeland Security either way when this policy, the secret policy, was um, initiated like a year ago or one more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. Okay. And did the White House weigh in either way at all? Did they just hands off, steer clear from it? Well, this is, uh, you know, obviously this is a program that is run by the Department of, of, uh, of Homeland Security, and uh, there are experts at that agency that are responsible for determining the proper way that those programs uh, should be conducted, uh, consistent with the uh, national security interests of the United States. Uh, and given the fact that, uh, you know, we're now in a situation where an individual has entered the United States through that program, uh, questions have been raised about whether or not enough safeguards are in place. And that's precisely what the Department of State and uh, Department of Homeland Security are taking a close look at right now. Does the White House itself, when they look at a prospective hire, do they consider uh, an applicant's social media posts when they're going back and reviewing their own applications? Uh, I can't speak to all of the processes that are in place for uh, individuals who are considered for uh, hiring at the White House, but if that were the case, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Uh, Mr. Vaquera. Thanks, Josh. Over the weekend, <coughs> um, 45 civilians died in bombings. Uh, in the Damascus area and much of the areas of Syria that are not controlled by ISIS but are under contest or contested by other rebel groups. Uh, the Assad regime air campaign coupled with uh, Russian assistance on that. The President has met face to face with Vladimir Putin twice since the Russians began their air campaign. He's tried uh, to jawbone him and I guess every other means possible to, to get Russia to change course. That's obviously not going to happen, and the President has talked repeatedly about the need for a solution on the diplomatic front in the Vienna talks, um, but Russia's so far not going to go along. There was ostensibly an agreement to ha have rebels represented at those talks. Russia has shot that down uh, just over the course of the last few days, is my understanding. Um, what are the prospects for the talks as they stand right now and the goal of the ceasefire to begin in just a couple of weeks at the beginning of the year, given the context of what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mike, I can tell you that, you know, for a detailed update of where things stand now, I'd refer to the State Department. Uh, but let me give you a sense of my understanding, and it won't, will not be as detailed as what you could get from over there. But uh, the progress that we've made along the diplomatic front thus far would not have been possible without the constructive participation of the Russians. Uh, and the progress that we've made has been to uh, lay out a timeline for a ceasefire and for a set of political talks. I recognize that sounds a little meager, uh, but when you consider the chaos that has uh, reigned inside of Syria for five years, that's an important step, and a step that was only possible because Secretary Kerry showed American leadership uh, in bringing all the relevant parties to the table. And these are parties like Iran and Saudi Arabia that um, are uh, figuratively and presumably in some cases even literally at each other's throats. Uh, you know, it also required the constructive participation of the Russians, who obviously have significant equities uh, inside of Syria, the only mil military base uh, in the world outside of uh, the former Soviet Union is in Syria. So uh, the Russians are quite concerned about uh, what the future of Syria looks like because of their own uh, investment in that country. Uh, what has also taken place is there was a meeting in Riyadh of a substantial number of uh, opposition groups. 
Uh, for years, we've been trying to work through a UN process to try to organize the Syrian opposition. Uh, that's been a difficult effort, but bringing 100 of them into the same room in the same city at the same time to have conversations about engaging in the political process uh, represents some important progress. Uh, so uh, I think what I would say is that uh, we have benefited from uh, Russia's constructive participation in these talks thus far. Uh, and I'm confident that this will be part of the discussion that Secretary Kerry has with President Putin uh, when he's in Moscow tomorrow. What's the, what is the likelihood, what is the reality <coughs> though, that the ceasefire, though, in principle agreed to, is actually going to happen? Well, uh, you know, we obviously are going to work very hard to try to achieve that goal. And I think we'll have a much better sense of the prospects uh, at the conclusion of the December 18th meeting that Secretary Kerry scheduled for New York. Okay. Bill Press, I'll give you the last one. <laughs> All right. No uh, pressure. Josh, somebody had to ask this, so I will. Um, you may know that do uh, Donald Trump's doctor just put out a statement <laughs> on his health. And he says, and I quote, if elected, Mr. Trump, I can state unequivocally, will be the healthiest individual ever elected to the presidency. <laughs> uh, do you accept that uh, President Obama is not as healthy as Donald Trump? <laughs> uh, is the suggestion that Mr. Trump's doctors conducted a thorough medical examination of uh, President Jefferson and President Adams. And, uh, that's a lot of work, a lot of homework to do. Uh, 44 presidents to take a look at. Or what serious um, health issues uh, affecting President Obama have you kept from us? Yeah. <laughs> None that I'm aware of. Uh, you've gotten some regular updates about the President's health uh, as well. And obviously this is um, um, the 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 health and medical examinations of the individual candidates is obviously a part of, uh, uh, of this process. Um, but I don't have a specific comment on uh, the findings of Mr. Trump's physician. Fact checks? <laughs> Fact. <laughs> I would not, uh, uh, from here, I would not call into question the, uh, the medical credentials of uh, somebody who decides they were ready to conduct a medical examination of Mr. Trump. That must have been uh, a pretty interesting appointment. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Just to be clear, the administration does still stand behind the swap for Bergdahl, yes? Uh, I, I didn't announce a change in our policy.